All right, we're going to start with our first bonding theory. And our first bonding theory we're going to call Lewis theory. This is also valence bond theory. And what we're going to make a simple assumption is we're going to look at how the valence electrons explain bonding. And we're going to assume here that the valence electrons are in their atomic orbitals. So if we had, for example, fluorine, we are going to assume that it's electrons. We've got two in the core. And then we have 2s2, 2p5. And we're going to start out assuming that our electrons are right there. And we've got seven valence electrons. And these are the electrons that are available for bonding. And when we use this, we're going to draw Lewis structures. And these are going to allow us to do a lot of really good prediction on the properties of the molecules. So let's remember, let's go back to our column and our group. And if we look at our main group elements, and remember when we look at these, we're going to ignore those transition elements. They're not going to be involved in covalent bonding anyways. Those are only going to be in nonmetals. And if we label these and we label these groups as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, ignoring this set right here, the group number tells us the valence electrons. Now, transition elements are going to have two, but we're going to leave that for ionic bonding. So if we have lithium or any element in group one, it's got one. If we go to carbon over here, it's in group four, and it's going to have four valence electrons. And so we know how many valence, and these valence are the reactive or the outer shell electrons or the electrons available for bonding. So if we know where they are in the periodic table, we know how many valence electrons they have. Now, we first of all start and we draw these, quote, Lewis symbols. We frequently call them Lewis dots. And one of the names for these structures are Lewis dot structures. We abandon the dots pretty quickly because they get really messy. But if we do that, we start out and we put our dots at right angles around the symbol for the element. So if we have carbon, which is in group four, we know it has four valence electrons. And we can kind of start anywhere on these guys, but frequently we start at one side and then we draw the rest at right angles. If we go here to nitrogen instead with five valence electrons and we draw its structure, we're going to go one, two, three, four, five. It doesn't matter where you put the pair together and where you put the single bonds or the single dots, excuse me, um, as long as you put them at right angles around the symbol of the element. So let's use our Lewis theory to explain ionic bonding and let's start out with sodium. Now, sodium is in group one, so it has one dot. Chlorine is in group seven and has seven dots. Now, it doesn't matter where you put these dots, as long as they're at right angles. We tend to put the free dot by itself closest to whatever it's bonding to, just so we can kind of see whether electrons are transferred or shared. So if we have our sodium and we have our chlorine. Now, we know these guys are not stable. We know they're not stable because we know the noble gases are stable. So noble gases are the things that we know are stable. This comes out of practice and this comes out of theory. And so if we have our noble gases as stable, we know our noble gases are in group eight. And we're going to call our rule here the octet rule. An octet here meaning group eight. So if we have group eight and our octet rule, then what we're going to do is we are going to look at these guys and see how we can obey it. Now, sodium, we know is neon, 3s1. And if we lose this electron, we're going to have eight left in the neon, and that's going to give us an octet. Chlorine here has seven. If it gains one, it is going to have an octet. So what is going to happen is this electron here from the sodium is going to go over there, and it's going to stick to the chlorine. And it's going to give us an Na plus and a Cl minus. Cl minus is going to have all eight electrons now. And when we bring these together, we're going to get our nice ionic compound of sodium with chlorine. Now, why is this ionic? It's ionic because the difference in electronegativity between sodium and chlorine is greater than 1.8. You can always look at the electronegativities up to see where your value is going to be. And because it's greater than this, is going to be an ionic bond. And the electron has been transferred. And we're going to stick together by simple electrostatic forces. So this is going to give us sodium chloride, NaCl. And then we can do this with things that are more interesting. We can do this with a calcium, which has two electrons. 
and a fluorine, which has seven. So if we take a fluorine and we take a calcium and we take this electron right here from the calcium and put it here, we're going to make calcium now with a positive and a fluorine with a negative, and that calcium still has one dot on it. Well, we know that's not stable because that's not obeying the octet rule. So we're going to find ourselves another fluorine with its seven electrons. And we're going to take that electron that's right here from the fluorine or the calcium and put it over here on this fluorine. And now we're going to have calcium losing its two electrons with two fluorides. And each of these fluorides now have eight electrons. And if we think about it, our dots make really good sense in terms of making ionic bonds because we're going to transfer enough electrons for stability, giving ourselves here one calcium and two fluoride ions. So let's look at covalent bonding. We know with covalent bonding, our electrons are going to be shared. We're going to have covalent bonding when the difference in electronegativity, our delta En, is going to be smaller, medium to small. This is going to occur in nonmetals. So if we have nonmetals with nonmetals, we're going to have smaller differences in electronegativity, and electrons are going to be shared. So we start out with our chlorine. We know chlorine has seven valence electrons. We draw ourselves another chlorine in here. Again, the easiest thing to do is to put the electron that can be shared as close to each other as possible. And we're going to bring these electrons in and we're going to share them. And when we do this, we're going to get a chlorine with a shared pair of electrons with a second chlorine. And that is our covalent structure or for this molecule. Now, to consider how this might be bonded, what we do is we draw circles around the element and the shared electrons. Now notice this chlorine sees eight, so it follows the octet rule. So our octet rule here is obeyed. This chlorine also sees eight electrons. We have one pair of electrons in the middle. and We call this a single covalent bond. So let's look at some rules and let's draw some. All right, let's look at covalent bonds. Covalent bonds occur between nonmetals. They're going to share electrons simply because both elements that you bring in or the multiple elements you bring in all have high ionization energies. They all have high electron affinities and high or larger electronegativities, meaning you have a bunch of elements that want electrons and nothing in there to lose electrons. So they are going to be sharing electrons. Now these shared electrons, because they have to be held in place by both of the atoms involved, are going to end up holding these atoms together to make molecules. And a covalent bond is a bond that occurs when you have two or more electrons that are shared by two different atoms. So why do they share? They share to obey the octet rule, so everything sees eight valence electrons. Why? Because eight valence electrons is stable. So we have our octet rule. And that's going to give us a nice low potential energy, a nice stability in between both of these guys as they come in and they share electrons. So the octet rule is what is going to govern this. Most elements are going to gain and lose electrons until they see eight. When the case of main or in case of our nonmetals, they're going to share electrons until they see a total of eight electrons. So share until they obey the octet rule. Now, the exception on this is hydrogen. Hydrogen is not going to have eight electrons. The nearest noble gas to hydrogen, which is the nearest stability point to hydrogen, is not eight electrons, it is two. Hydrogen is a 1s1, helium is a 1s2, so hydrogen is only ever going to have a total of two electrons because two electrons is the maximum stability. So hydrogen will only ever have two electrons. Okay? Don't ever put it in the center of a molecule where it's going to have more than two. Hydrogen is always going to be outside on a molecule such that it has one bond and shares a max of two electrons. 
So let's draw some Lewis structures. So first of all, if we have anything of the form x, y to the n, there's a 99% chance that this x is going to be in the middle. So if we have CH4, the carbon is going to be in the center of our skeletal structure. Now, another rule is to put the least electronegative element in the center, but it's except hydrogen. The rule is hydrogen is always going to be on the outside. So we have our skeletal structure. That is going to be how it hooks together. Now, we have to count the total number of valence electrons. So if we have carbon, carbon is in group four. So we have four. Hydrogen is going to be in group one, and we have four of them. So we're going to have four times one for a total of eight electrons. Now, we're going to draw single bonds such that we have complete octets for everything except hydrogen. And we're going to put single bonds to the central atoms and the spare electrons on the outside until we get a complete octet. And then we're going to look at them and see what else we need to do in order to make a complete octet. We may have to do a double or a triple bond, moving electrons to make things work. So one way to start this would be to start it as dots. Please note we abandoned dots very quickly. We know that carbon has four. We know that each hydrogen has one. And if we bring our hydrogens in and with their one dot, we're going to make CH4, and we're going to make that. So how do we actually do it? Well, what we actually do is we draw single bonds as a single line. So if we have two electrons in a bond, we're going to designate it by a single line. And we're going to remember that this is equal to two, and this is also equal to two electrons. So if we take and we start out with our carbon, and we have our four hydrogens, and we put our bonds in, and we count our electrons as we go. We're gonna go two, four, six, eight, and that is our Lewis structure of methane. You can do it as the dots, it just gets very ugly as you go. So we have to account for all the electrons, making sure that we have followed the octet rule. If our element has too few, we're gonna to have to make a double or a triple bond. If it's got too many, we may have a hypervalent or expanded octet. So single bonds. Single bonds is when uh, two atoms share one pair. So if we take and we bring in, let's say, bromine reacting with a bromine, and we consider the dots, and we know that bromine has seven. Let's change color, and let's give this bromine seven electrons. And if we can imagine bringing those guys in, if we share these dots in the middle, each bromine is going to see a total of eight, and we're going to follow the octet rule. The ones in the center are going to be our single bond. The pairs of electrons that are unshared are called lone pairs. So an unshared pair of electrons is a lone pair of electrons. And we're going to shift our electrons around until we have a, the octet rule followed. So if we look at bromine and we realize that we have seven times two is our number of valence electrons, which is 14. To draw the structure, we're simply going to do bromine. We're going to single bond it to the other bromine. And then we're going to put the remaining electrons on as dots on the outside. And we're going to count to make sure that we have the right number. And when we do that, we're going to go 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 electrons. We have the correct number, and we've obeyed the octet rule. So let's consider O2. O2 is going to have 2 times 6 because it's in group 6. So we know it doesn't have quite enough electrons to make this work. We know that each oxygen needs two more. How do we know that each oxygen needs two more? Because that's six and we need a total of eight for the octet rule. So a couple of ways of doing this are to realize that if we have our two oxygens, each of these guys have six electrons, we can shift our dots around to make this work. But we realize if we bring in one pair, one set of dots, that's not going to be sufficient. If we have our dots like this, and we've brought in one set to make one single bond, 
nothing has obeyed the octet rule, and that is because each oxygen has only gained one more electron and it needs two. If we bring in these guys as well, and we make a double bond, we're going to obey the octet rule. Again, how do we actually do it? We actually do it by going, okay, oxygen, single bond to each of them, and then count and realize that we have two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. That is an insufficient number of electrons. And remember, two times six is twelve, which is the maximum number we can put on this structure. We realize that this oxygen sees eight, this oxygen sees six, and we can shift our lone pairs until we get stability and we follow the, elect the octet rule. So we're shifting two electrons in from the oxygen that has sufficient to the side where it has insufficient with the one that had six, giving us a double bond. 